so welcome everyone uh, to our first uh, edition of the South Asian Studies Colloquium for the spring semester. Uh, my name is Rohit Day. I'm a historian and the chair for the South Asian Studies Council. And we are delighted to have with us today uh, Professor Jessica Namakal. Um, and uh, it's it's partly you know the, the the strength of Jessica's work. This is uh, I think the first event that the South Asian Studies Council and um, the European Studies are doing hosting together. I'm really grateful to Lauren Crawford and everyone else uh, in the European Studies program who sort of worked uh, with us to put this put this together. So uh, Professor Namakal is the Associate Professor of the Practice of International and Comparative Studies at Duke University. Um, and her first book she's going to talk about today, Unsettling Utopia, The Making and Unmaking of French India, presents a new account of the history of 20th century French India to show how colonial projects persist beyond formal decolonization. Uh, Professor Namakal is also currently working on two new projects, one that looks at the decolonizing of decolonization of cults, and the other, a history of sexuality, race mixing, and colonialism in the 20th century. Uh, Professor Namakal has a PhD in history from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and has been at Duke University uh, since then. I also want to briefly introduce our uh, two commentators. Uh, so, uh, who will speak after Professor Namakal? Um, Kelvin Ng is a PhD candidate in the History Department at Yale. His research brings together the social history of migration and the intellectual history of internationalism in four linked Indian Ocean spaces, British India, Republican China, British Malaya, and the Dutch East Indies. His research interests more broadly include political economy, intellectual history, histories of migration, and histories of the left. And he's published work in the comparative studies of histories, comparative studies of South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, South Asian history and culture, and South Asia. Ali Tulila is a first year PhD student at the Department of French at Yale uh, and has graduated in 2021 with a degree in history from Earlham College. Prior to coming to Yale, he worked as a research assistant on a Columbia University led oral history project entitled Life Histories in Northwest Africa and interned as a researcher for the daily newspapers Al Watan and Anfas in Morocco. Ali's research interests include Francophone poetry and music, Maghrebi and Banaliu literature, intellectual and cultural history, post-colonial theory, colonialism and imperialism, critical theory and cultural studies. So with that, I turn over to Jessica uh, to walk us through uh, this terrific book. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you to uh, Professor Day for the invitation to the South Asian Studies Colloquium and the Modern Europe Colloquium. I said this is, I think, the first time I've been invited to um, do both the South Asia and the Europe uh, Colloquium together. So that's that's great. Um, it's exactly what I was aiming for. So I appreciate that. Um, also, thanks to uh, Amar and Ryan for the tech support for putting things together into the Macmillan Center and also to Kelvin and Ali for taking the time uh, to be here and give comments. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, um, of course. Let's see. OK, let's get into the right mode here. Okay, uh, here we go. Okay, so the book, uh, the book is called Unsettling Utopia, Making an Unmaking of French India. Um, and I just wanna start by showing this map of what French India is. This is actually not completely inclusive um, because there's some little areas um, called loges that are basically factory towns, um, sort of early special economic zones really, um, that are not noted on this map that are spatter, uh, scattered across the subcontinent as well. Um, but the five major territories uh, that were under French rule in South Asia were Chandanagore, which is up by Calcutta, basically a suburb of Calcutta today, uh, Yanam, which is in Andhra, uh, Pondicherry, which is the headquarters and remains sort of the cultural marker of what French India was and is, um, which is just about 100 kilometers south of Chennai or Madras, uh, Karikal, which is the closest to Pondicherry, um, and then Mahe, which is over in Kerala, birthplace of M. Night Shyamalan. There's a fun fact for everyone. Um, so um, I, one thing I'll point out about this map before I go on also is that um, today, the starred areas here, which is everything but Chandranagar, are the Union Territory of Pondicherry. Um, so they're, they're administered as a federal unit uh, today um, as a territory. Uh, they are not part of the states that surround them. Um, 
which is a result of all of these uh, diplomatic conversations that happened around this time period that I'm writing about. And Chandanagar uh, stands apart from that because they actually had a referendum in 1949 and voted to join the Indian Union. Um, and that's part of the story here. But uh, so today Chandranagar is not a part of the Union territory, although they, um, there are some interesting sort of links to French culture that still exists there today. So um, with, with, with that, uh, just sort of on the table there, I wanna talk a little bit about what this book is um, and sort of the question of why, uh, why I did this research, um, what, what were the big questions that went into this? So one of the, uh, the major uh, motivating factors here was my desire to push back against a tendency in political and, and sometimes cultural histories um, and, and by this, I really mean histories <laughs> in the discipline of history, um, to naturalize state-sponsored decolonization. Um, I argue in the book that decolonization should also be understood not just as a moment, but as a movement, one that does not have a linear, uh, always have a linear or a upwards or a sort of um, progressive trajectory. Um, so, you know, the, the tendency to sort of treat 1947 in South Asian history as a watershed moment. Um, that's the end of the colonial era. Um, and now we've moved into the post-colonial, which of course uh, Rohit's book does also um, by looking at the constitution. Um, you know, so it's not, it's not entirely a unique argument in that sense, but I think, you know, there's still a tendency to really think that, um, that colonialism ends in 1947. Um, so by looking at an area that is considered, you know, in the words of British diplomats, a backwater, <laughs> and actually many Indians do, um, and, uh, but also as sort of these minor territories, right? Um, to, to look at that and, and to think what, you know, how does this uh, sort of shift our view of what decolonization in South Asia has, has looked like? Um, when uh, popular histories and academic histories of this era in, in India, when they uh, even sort of look at French India, it's usually as a, either as an afterthought or it's really incorporated into um, the, the anti-colonial movement in British India, which I show is just not the case. Um, you know, the timeline is different and I'll get into that in a moment, um, but also the interests are different, the debates are different, the questions are different. People in French India had different legal rights than people in British India. Um, this is actually very, very important to people who live in French India, right? Um, because not only uh, have they been sort of treated differently and for good and for bad, and, and I can get into that. Um, but they've also, uh, they've also, you know, in many cases, um, learned French that, you know, we have people that speak both French and Tamil, right? <laughs> um, not English and Hindi, right? So you, you have all these sort of different language formations um, going on. There's a lot of pride around um, an association with France as they, um, as an old colony of the French empire, right? They were around during the French revolution. People in uh, the French territories wrote letters uh, to, the, to the revolutionary government, right? So there is sort of this feeling that they are different. There's also a real tendency by some of the leaders of uh, the Indian anti-colonial movements, people like Gandhi, people like Nehru, to sort of um, have a deep Francophilia um, and to say France is better, France was, France is better. <laughs> France is better than England, right? Um, and, and, you know, anybody that has studied the French empire, especially, you know, what happens with Haiti, um, but also in Algeria and, and other places know that this is a facade in many ways, but it's a very strong argument um, in, in this space. So ultimately, you know, there's a lot more and I'll, I'll go into it uh, briefly that goes into this, but ultimately the driving force behind this book um, was then my desire to bring sort of the idea of decolonial methods um, to the writing of the history of decolonization. I saw a real sort of la um, as a divide, a real gap between um, the praxis of decolonization and, and histories written about decolonization. Like they weren't even the, in the same, realm, right? They sort of existed on separate planes, right? But, you know, um, I had a lot of questions, right? What is the difference between anti-colonialism and decolonization, right? Where, where does independence fit into this, right? Really in the South Asian context, we're talking about independence. People are fighting for independence. They're not fighting for decolonization. That wasn't the language then, right? So does this sort of fight for sovereignty mean the same thing um, that it might mean to people in other parts of the empire, people later in the 1960s who might be reading Fanon, 
right? And using the language of decolonization and the way he writes about it in The Wretched of the Earth, right? So, so I had a lot of questions about what it might look like in this um, in minor territory or minor spaces. Um, so with that said, um, let's see. I'm gonna um, move to talk about uh, sort of time a little bit. One of the things I'm trying to do in this book, or I hope I did, was um, change our thinking on the space and time of colonialism and decolonization in South Asia. And so I have it as a good historian, uh, which I hope to be, um, I have a timeline. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of it, but uh, for people who are totally new to the, you know, the French being in India, just an idea of what it looks like and how the timeline of the French being in India is incredibly important to understanding sort of comparative colonialisms. Because when we say, I, you know, I don't actually like that term comparative colonialisms very much because they're interacting with each other all the time, right? They're, you know, the French and the British and, you know, in the 17th century in India, of course, we're also talking about the Portuguese, we're talking about the Dutch, we're talking about the Danes, um, we're talking about the Spanish. There are so many people that are trying to get their, their fingers into, into the subcontinent at that time that they're all playing off each other. And of course, this becomes a huge global proxy war uh, between England and France, which you know comes to North America, which comes to South America. Um, but you know, Pondicherry and French India is, is a part of this history, right? Understanding it. So we start in 1667. I, you know, people ask me a, a lot, you know, what were the French doing in India? And they said they were doing the same thing everyone else was doing in India, right? Trying to establish ports, trying to establish trade routes, um, you know, like looking to um, to get into uh, new in, new um, new exports, right? Um, so it, you start with the French East India Company, right? Um, you go through sort of the major wars in the 18th century. Uh, French India is often involved in this. There's a real moment in the, in the 18th century where France thinks they have a chance, right? Um, they're sort of battling um, near Madras um, to, uh, to, to gain power. Um, if you know the story of Tipu Sultan, of course, um, he sides with the French. Uh, this is all um, stuff I don't actually write about, but these, these, these things are all important here. Okay, so um, an important date here is 1816, right? Um, this, is a, this is a moment after the revolution, after Napoleon's fall, where um, the French and the British come to an agreement on the territories in India. And this agreement really remains until the end, uh, until they leave, um, which they agreed to leave in 1954. They don't actually ratify that till 1962. We'll get to that in a second. So through the second Treaty of Paris in 1814, all the French settlements and factories in India are restored to the French on the condition that they have no military presence, right? So they're sort of taking any chance of them trying to fight a war is taken away. They are allowed to have a police force, which again will become important. Um, but they remain, and you know, there's something in you know, there's something to it in France that this is really seen as a failed empire, right? You know, India is very important to the French, right? Uh, culturally, in terms of a great civil, a once great civilization, um, you know, you have all kinds of social scientists going into the you know early or the late 19th century, um, going doing work in France, um, studying language, you know, so it's it. it, it occupies a lot of the French imagination. Um, and so, you know, they really like having this association and it's a chance for them, I argue, right? To really say, look at, you know, how we understand people in India better than the British do, right? We have these sort of cultural connections um, that, that we are interested in exploring. Um, and so it's sort of venerated in, the, in that sense. And so th those become real cultural markers, even though there is sort of a sense of failure around it. So not to jump forward uh, 100 plus years, but here we are. Um, so of course, Indian independence, 1947. Um, so 1949, that referendum I mentioned in Chandanagar happens. Um, and, and this referendum is really important. And it's important because um, you know, after 1947, you know, the Nehru, and Nehru sort of says, okay, just, just hang tight, French India, we're going to get you out of this, like, you'll be a part of India, but we need to do some negotiations. But on the ground, um, you know, you had a lot of different opinions. And what France was aiming for, and this was, they were doing this throughout the empire, was to get people who lived in French territories to join what they were calling the French Union. Um, and so they built it into their new um, constitution after the war, um, the constitution of the Fourth Republic, that they would um, 
hold referendums in, in the colonies, in the territories, and peep, the people would, would decide, right? Um, and so the Indian government allows this to happen in 1949. It's a landslide. So you think, no problem, right? Why wouldn't they let this happen in the other four, um, the, the other four territories? And it, it never happens. Uh, um, so I go into that in the book. And one of my arguments is that, you know, the, the states deliberately and strategically were trying to find a way to work together as in a as a as a friendly diplomatic relationship like this relationship was very important to Nehru he had a lot of struggles right he actually he supported um the struggles in Indochina he supported the struggles in Algeria right um but at the same time he he knew he need, sort of needed to make friends with France um uh in in many ways um and again this is this has to do with sort of a rejection of, of England um and trying to, to, so this happens sort of under the radar, right? And, I, and one of my arguments is, is why we haven't heard about it a lot. So there is, um, there is a lot of things that happen on the borders and I'll talk about borders in a second here, um, but, but um, this, this moment of, of uh, the referendum is really important. So 1954 and, and important to the French empires, this is uh, early in 1954, this is when the French lose um, in Indochina, right? Um, and, and so they've lost their first big part, part of the empire, of their empire, right? Um, and, and so, you know, this is, this, is a, this is a marker. When 1947 happened, you know, everybody was watching what was happening. You know, the, all the people in the other colon, in the British colonies were like, is, you know, what's gonna happen next? Do we, you know, there was so much global attention on the anti-colonial movements on what was happening you know, on the violence of partition. Um, and uh, for the French, you know, it caused a lot of anxiety. <laughs> you know, if the British Empire is gonna go down, what is going to happen to us? Um, so it is important to note that the, you know, the decolonization that happens in French India really follows the trajectory of the French empire. They're not gonna let it go. They agree a lot of things happen in this period between 49 and 54. Um, there's a lot of border security that happens. Um, people are sort of fleeing from side to side. Um, and they agree in November of 1954 to leave, um, but they don't ratify that until they have lost Algeria in 1962. So everyone's just sort of hanging on, <laughs> right, while the war in Algeria is happening, um, which is really fascinating in a lot of ways. So this is just a totally different timeline, right, um, for, for independence, decolonization, sovereignty. In, in South Asia than that we're used to. And also, you know, shows us how people's experience living in India is also being affected by what's going on in the French empire, right? Um, so shifting our time. And the other um, thing I, I really focus on in the book is shifting our sense of space. Um, so the, I'm gonna just to not talk too long. Um, I have three points um, that I'd like to highlight from the book. The first is bordering incarcerality. The second is this idea of anti-colonial colonialism and the last is settler utopianism. So I'll start with bordering incarcerality here. Um, so I showed you that map before, but this is a, a close close up map of the territories. Um, and you can see this most clearly in Pondicherry, that it is a it is an area that is broken up um, quite <laughs> quite severely. Um, so that black uh, that you see in Pondicherry um, there in the in the circle that is all French territory, and then the gray surrounding it that is all British territory, right? So it's um, the picture on the cover of the book is a police officer. It's in 1953 standing in the middle of a village um, uh, next to a line of rocks. And that is the border between uh, India. Well, that was 53, so that's India and, and French India, um, but it's the same border. It doesn't change after 1947. Um, so, you know, you have these really um, uh, villages split in two, right? Uh, where one, one side of the street is British and one side is French. And then, you know, one side is Indian and one side is French. So it's, um, it's really interesting. And it had been like that for, for a long time. It's actually still like this, although the borders aren't there as much. But if you have been to Pondicherry, you will, you know, if you've driven around, you drive past concrete stanchions all the time that say you are leaving the Union Territory of Pondicherry. And then two kilometers later, you're entering the Union Territory. So they they still ex exist, which is a little bit um, a little bit funny. 
Um, okay, so another close up here, um, a, sort of a clearer map, and then the uh, the other map, um, the the one with the colors on it, that is that is sort of the central part of Pondicherry, um, and so the blue that you see in the middle there, that's a that's a sewage canal. Um, and under right here is the Bay of Bengal. Um, so you have the sea. Um, and so this, this, uh, this portion right under the sewage canal is what was called White Town or Ville Blanche um, starting in the 17th century uh, or maybe early 18th century. And then above that was called Ville Noir, right? Black Town. Um, so you have even within these uh, this, um, discontinuous territories, you still have further sort of segregation, right? And segregation by race. It was never any sort of pure segregation, right? And racial segregation. Um, there was never enough white, people in Pondicherry to, to really populate this. Um, but, you know, you had sort of quarters of, you had a lot of um, mixed people, you had people um, who had, um, you know, some sort of European heritage. Um, so you had all, um, you had sort of interesting uh, mixtures of people that changed over time, but it becomes the very wealthy area. If you, again, if you've gone to Pondicherry, this is the part that looks nice, right? It's on the, uh, it's on the grid. Um, so, you know, it has quiet streets. Um, you know, uh, it has a park in the middle here, you see a, a nice park, sort of a, a French type park. It has the architecture that you would see in other French colonial cities like New Orleans or, um, or Saigon um, or other places where the, where the French were and very similar architecture. Um, so uh, the other thing that you see on this map and this map was, um, this is a map from the Indian National Trust, but it's also been uh, sort of modified by the ashram, which I'll get to. But um, you can there's there's a uh, the presence of the Aurobindo ashram, which is the other major part of this story, um, is all in White Town. So you can actually see. I mean, they have some property now outside here, um, but they sort of settle White Town um, beginning in the 1930s, and they own a massive amount of the property um, that's in that area. Um, so I will talk about that a little bit in a minute, but um, there's your sort of spatial idea. So in the book, I talk about the borders here um, and what happened at the borders. And, and in terms of the independence movement in French India, um, these borders become really important. Um, you know, I, I, I should have put another picture in here, but uh, before I get to this picture, so that the, the borders um, were really uh, became securitized um, and policed starting in the 1910s um, and, and really ramping up in the 1920s and 1930s. And this was because Pondicherry became a space for anti-colonial exiles. Um, so people from all over, um, people from neighboring Tamil Nadu, but people um, from all over India who were sort of fleeing British persecution would find refuge in Pondicherry. And so this is part of the reason that uh, these borders become much more important. Um, and again, this, this dates back to this proxy war with, uh, with between France and England. You know, when they, in 1816, when they said, you can stay there, but you can't have a military presence, did they imagine one day, you know, all of their political, um, anti-colonial political operatives would be hiding in there? Probably not, right? This was a huge uh, issue for, for the French Indian police, um, I'm sorry, for the British police force in India, um, who really sort of thought all the hot, like hotbed of revolutionary activity was happening here. It was also an important uh, port for anti-colonial um, seditious material. So if people were printing, you know, their manuals, um, their anti-colonial literature in France and in Russia, they would send it to Pondicherry. Right, and it could enter that way. Um, so these borders become really important to them. Um, and, and what you're seeing here is um, a picture from much later from 1952, but this is a picture on the border and sort of the best picture of a lot of people standing on the border I have. Um, and what happens right after independence in 47, basically is the French India administration says, you can't have a protest in French India, no protests. Um, so what happens is you have, uh, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people gathering on the French India, India border and protesting the continued French presence. So you could see in the foreground here, um, the French police with their kepi hats, um, sort of holding back 
all of these people and the, the police sort of represent the border there. Again, it's like such a flimsy border, right? Because it's uh, basically rocks or there isn't actually anything there, but they're yelling anti-colonial slogans into French India, right? So there's all kinds of ways that the borders sort of become marked. Um, the other sort of interesting thing about the borders is in, in some areas they build a, they build the physical fence in both Pondicherry and Karakal. Um, again, there's so many of them, they can't enclose the whole thing. Um, but this idea came from um, a British police officer named Charles Tagart, uh, who was in the Calcutta police force, who was, you know, really, really rapidly offended by all the anti-colonials hiding in French India, and um, he was also responsible for building some of the first walls in Palestine um, as part of the, the British police force. So you can see sort of the transnational movement of, of, of these bordering practices. Um, so I have a few other images from um, the India, French India liberation movement. Again, there's, you know, there's a lot of people that are, it, it becomes a real anti-French anti colonial movement, but there are plenty of people who are pretty ambivalent about this in French India. Um, you see a cartoon from a Tamil newspaper here that's uh, the French uh, administrator has, has written the French subtitles on it, but you can see, um, you know, the various parts of the French empire kicking out France. <laughs> there you have Indochina, Pondicherry and Mahe, which is one of the territories. Um, so you do get something of an anti-colonial movement um, that, that picks up in Pondicherry um, and really you know, happens around these borders. And, and because of the borders, it creates sort of this system of refugees and exiles too, which is an interesting point. All right, um, so the, the, I'm gonna move on to talking about anti-colonial colonialism. Um, and that brings us back to White Town um, and, and Pondicherry and political exiles. So um, uh, who you're seeing here is Sri Aurobindo Ghosh. And this, is, this picture was actually taken right before um, his death in 1950. Um, but Aurobindo uh, was a, is, is a very famed Bengali uh, Indian nationalist. Um, he grew up in an Anglophone family um, outside of Calcutta, went to some Catholic convent schools, was sent to England at a pretty young age, went to Cambridge, learned Greek, Latin, poetry, um, did the whole sort of thing, was meant to become a, an Indian civil servant and come back to India and work for the empire. And uh, according to his biographers, he has this moment um, while he's studying, uh, well, living in England where he's like, this is racist, right? <laughs> it's true, quite truly like, this is racist. I don't wanna do this anymore. Um, the story is that he failed his, um, at, in, like his equine test on purpose. Um, you know, I don't know how much of that is myth or not, but uh, he sails back to India, um, right? Uh, I think in 1905, right, when Bengal is being partitioned um, and, and takes up the movement, um, has publications, becomes really well known. He, uh, you know, um, very quickly, you know, he is on the side of, of um, using whatever means necessary you need. Uh, so he is associated with bombing cases, um, with violence directed towards the empire. And in 1910, after some of this has been going on for a while, I mean, he, he works as a school principal. He's like doing all kinds of things in Baroda. Um, and after uh, he is wanted in the Alipur bombing case, he goes to Chandanagar, gets on a ship, goes to Pondicherry and never comes back. Um, so from 1910 to 1950, when he passes away, he is in Pondicherry. He is easily hands down the most famed um, person in Pondicherry. Um, you know, he goes and he's this political operative, right? This is what he's known for. Um, and people, you know, people are coming to see him. England's trying to get France to give him back. You know, they won't. And they're like, this is our jurisdiction. They were surveilling him. They were surveilling what he was doing. Uh, France was very aware that uh, people might protest them as well, um, but but they still chose to keep people safe um, from the from the British police. Uh, so Orban, pretty quickly, he sort of goes into uh, sort of a meditation. He sort of stops meeting with people as much, and he decides he's going to devote himself to um, philosophy and to spirituality. Um, so, you know, long story short, he creates this system of thought called Integral Yoga. He's publishing some new journals out of Pondicherry. He's not involved with the anti-colonial scene anymore. This is kind of the important point, right? Um, 
the woman that you see him with, her name is, he, he gave her the name, the mother in 1926, but she uh, was born Mira Alfasa. Uh, she was born in Paris, the child of two Sephardic Jewish people um, who had come from both Turkey and Egypt, um, that she was born in Paris. Um, they were both bo born in the, in the 1880s. Um, and uh, Mira Alfasa was a, into the occult. She was a painter. Um, she traveled to um, Algeria to live with Max Teon, uh, who was part of the uh, cosmic movement um, in Algeria, another um, sort of uh, another, well, I won't get into that, another sort of a spiritual settlement uh, in the French empire. Um, and so she sort of has this background. She is married to a man, um, named Paul Richard and Paul Richard works for the French empire. He is a colonial, he's a colonial civil servant. He is also interested in these things um, in Eastern thought, you know, they're, they have sort of, sort of some things to do with theosophy um, and uh, he gets stationed in Pondicherry and they're very excited because they really want to meet Sri Aurobindo. Um, so they go to Pondicherry in 1914. Um, they have to leave fairly quickly because of the war. Uh, they go to Japan, uh, they come back, um, and uh, they create some new journals together. They're really uh, sort of engaged in his thought. Um, Richard leaves Pondicherry to, to never return um, after a few years, and the mother then stays um, for the rest of her life, as well as sort of the spiritual companion to Aurobindo. Um, so they, they officially established the ashram in 1926. Here's a picture from 1930. Um, and it becomes the, the easily the most famous place in Pondicherry very quickly. Um, because of their backgrounds, people that are mostly coming there are, are Bengalis and French people, right? And this changes over the years, but at first that's what it is, Bengalis and French people. Um, and they're coming to, you know, to, uh, to be in study um, what, what uh, Aurobindo and the mother have. Aurobindo has really retreated by the time the ashram starts. He spends most of his time in solitude and the mother is the person that's running everything quite easily. Um, so they, they become you know, this major cultural space. People around the world know who they are. And this is really important to the French government in, in India, right? Um, so again, it's like, it's, you know, Pondicherry has over a million people today, which is like average for an Indian city, but pretty big. Um, and is, but at the time was much smaller. Um, so really is seen as sort of a sleepy place um, and people, uh, you know, the French that are sent there don't, don't think much of it. And the British really don't. Um, their consulate reports are quite negative about living in Pondicherry. Um, but they, they all want to get to know Aurobindo and the mother, right? They, they, like, they have a common language. Um, they feel like they can talk to them, right? So they really see them as the people that can tell them about what's going on um, in, in Pondicherry. And so while they claim to have no political agenda, right? And they're not sort of making any comments about what's going on with independence, you know, or Bendo is consulted and he says, you know, I think everybody should have sovereignty. Um, like I'm for independence, but I like I don't get involved in politics anymore. Um, this kind of thing. People who lived in Pondicherry, you know, saw them as sort of the biggest political actor in Pondicherry. Um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of questions about what they're actually involved with. Um, and you know, the mother's brother. Um, Matteo was the governor of uh, French Congo, right? So they they have these deep ties to the empire, right? So this is what this is what led me to sort of think about this idea of anti-colonial colonialism. They're both known as huge, hugely important sort of anti-colonial figures. Yet in practice, what they're really doing um, is both supporting and um, and sort of giving, uh, giving, I don't know, capital to um, to these systems of, of colonial governance, right? It's it's helping people continue to govern. Um, so there's this real split there. So Aurobindo dies in 1950, um, and the mother keeps the ashram going. Um, here's her in 1955 with uh, Nehru and Indira Gandhi, um, and also the, the chief minister of Tamil Nadu at the time. They're at the ashram, and I am sure you will all notice something about this map <laughs> here that you see. This is the map that stands to the day to this day in the ashram. Um, so this is 55. The French have agreed to leave, but they haven't left. 
Um, and the mother is always seated um, in front of this un, uh, map of undivided India. I mean, it includes Sri Lanka. Right? It's, um, it's quite, quite expansive. Right, um, and it's interesting the the Oroville symbol that she created there. You'll see actually comes from the the cosmic movement, the one that was based in Algeria. So there's sort of links to her other her other connections there. Um, but she is making this argument, right, um, that that one that will be familiar to those who have read Edward Said, <laughs> and. Um, and thought about sort of Eastern spiritualism, this argument that uh, India, undivided India, all of this land is a spiritual space. Like the politics don't really matter, right? It's a land of spirituality and that's embedded in the soil. And this becomes really important for the creation of um, the next project that comes out of this, um, which is uh, that of Oroville. Um, which is uh, something I theorize in the book as um, being an example of settler utopianism. Um, so quickly, I know I've been going on for a while. Um, what I mean by this is, um, is that, uh, you know, India is not a settler colony, right? Um, there's no argument that it was, um, Pondicherry certainly not. But there, there is this kind, there's, there is this um, sort of brand of spiritual settlement that happens and it actually creates physical land-based projects of settlement. So Oroville, you'll see a, a model of it here from before it was built and it doesn't quite look like this, but the idea was to make it look like a galaxy. Um, Oroville was a project envisioned by Aurobindo and the mother. Um, and uh, it comes to fruition in 1968, quite an important year with the support of UNESCO, um, with the support of all of these governments around the world. And it's meant to be a utopian intentional community where people would, um, everybody would be a world citizen, um, you know, uh, and everyone would work together, this kind of thing. Um, in the, in the uh, they would do so as long as they subscribe to this sort of idea of spirituality put forth by the mother in Orbindo. And that's, that's sort of the key to this, right? That to be a member of the community, and this becomes quite important when we think about what settler colonialism is, you had to believe in the life divine. Right. And who's that decided by? That's decided by a council of Oravillians who are, unlike the ashram, Oroville is mostly started by Europeans who are coming and not just Europeans, but Australians, Canadians, um, very wealthy Americans. <laughs> um, in fact, people uh, of high prestige are going to sort of start this experiment. Um, what you see on the other side here, of course, is a picture of some people sort of enjoying the scenery and then Tamil women working, right? Which is exactly what happens, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, that uh, this land was sort of bought quite cheaply from local farmers. Uh, you have people that haven't been to India. Sometimes people, you know, eventually people from other parts of India come um, and they settle there and they create this township based on this idea that the mother says, Although I am French by birth, India is my true country, the country of my soul and spirit. Spiritually, I am Indian. I hope I shall be allowed to adopt a double nationality. That is to say, to remain French while I become an Indian. Um, you know, this is sort of her take on, on uh, decolonization, on um, what the world should look like. And you had the ashram really pushing for, I mean, they wrote letters to Nehru asking for dual citizenship. Um, there's a whole campaign there. And, you know, her idea, of course, is that, you know, this is, I truly belong here because my spiritual soul is here. And this is what Oroville is based on, really, this idea that if you have a certain worldview, then that, that this is the place where you belong. Um, so, you know, her idea is that people need to do the yoga of work. Um, but you, you know, reading uh, the, the oral histories and the narratives of people that went there and, you know, their language hasn't changed much. There's not much self-reflection to this very day um, that uh, they really say we showed up and then we, uh, we hired people to do the labor, right? Um, so uh, quite, quite quickly, they sort of give it up and say, so this is, this is, you know, this is, pure labor extraction. They, they bought the land, um, they sort of created it as their own. 
Um, I won't read these because I've been going on for so long. There was a documentary that ran on Netflix that's still up there. Um, it's a BuzzFeed India documentary. It's uh, called India's Utopia about Orville. Um, this is an older man named Johnny who came from Australia, you know, and he just straight up tells the reporter, like, I was a racist. I got in these fights with the people in the villages. Um, you know, a I had a guy cut me with a machete once. But really, you know, uh, we all need the forest and all the credit to this forest really goes to these village boys that did all the work. Um, so Oroville is a really successful in terms of, um, uh, of its um, economy, right? Uh, in terms of its projects, it has, it does reforest reforestation. It has all of these cottage industries. You can find their incense at Whole Foods. Right, um, they've done very well, right? And they still exist, they're still going. Um, but right, uh, unacknowledged is that uh, all, almost all of the labor comes from people from uh, surrounding villages, right? Um, and that like they've started to let in a few more people from the local villages, but even when they do, right? It has completely disrupted sort of local, um, you know, family structures, et cetera, um, because it's like one person that will go, it's usually a male. Um, so there's all kinds of things to, to think about there. Um, so I have called this sort of process uh, settler utopianism. Um, meanwhile, in Pondicherry, and I'll end here, right, you have, um, you know, <laughs> there's so much to talk about, so I'll end here, but, um, you know, up to 10,000 people who are French uh, citizens who vote in elections, right? Who have passports to France, but maybe, or EU passports, but maybe will never have the means to go there. Um, you know, and Orville is right outside of this area and it's built sort of a wall around itself, right? It's built a lot of walls actually. Um, that's just completely um, sort of divorced from what's going on here in Pondicherry. Um, but at the same time is sort of taking all of these resources. So I argue this is a way to see how the French presence sort of continues and, and operates a lot of what is there. Okay, I will stop now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jessica. So we we'll quickly move, we're gonna have two short responses from Kelvin and Ali before opening, opening it up to the floor for a larger discussion. So Kelvin. Of course, uh, thank you, Rohit, and thank you so much, Professor Namakal, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, it's really sort of close to my heart because one of the archives I'm visiting is in Kota Pupam in just outside of Pondicherry. Um, and many of the sort of uh, anti-colonial materials that I'm sort of gathering that are in Tamil, that made their way not just to Madras, Madurai, or Tanjavur, but more further afield to Rangoon and Singapore, were published in Pondicherry, like you said. So I will sort of limit my uh, comments to three broad themes. Firstly, uh, the contribution of your work to post-partition histories of South Asia. Second, uh, to studies of settled colonialism and um, settler societies writ large. And thirdly, to intellectual histories of colonialism and liberalism. Um, so on the first, I think that um, it's probably a truism at this point to observe that the dominant horizon of most modern histories of India have clustered around the 1947 moment, anchoring either independence or partition as the, the decisive political juncture of India's 20th century. Um, so I, I would say that recently an emergent strand of historical literature, especially over the past two decades, has reflected a wide range um, of concerns um, and brought these concerns to bear in the, on the post-colonial histories of South Asia. Um, so whereas this has previously been a province of political scientists, anthropologists, sociologists, the growing availability of new archival sites and materials, as well as the resurgence of questions around communalism and fundamentalism, um, social protests and activist mobilization, as well as forms of economic and political inequality, have, sought, have uh, revivified this sort of interest in post-independence, post-partition histories of South Asia. Um, so one might observe three domains of historical inquiry in this literature. Firstly, works on economic development and planning. Secondly, works around um, crisis of democracy, whether posed as a question of communalism, fundamentalism, separatism, or militarism. And thirdly, most substantially, works in political and legal history that have examined questions of citizenship and belonging, tracing the uneven and processual nature of national citizenship as a site of ongoing contestation. So I would say that your work belongs most uh, clearly to this third tradition, but contributes very significantly 
significantly to our understanding of the other two fields. Um, and to this third tradition, uh, we, we could sort of uh, name scholars such as uh, Niraja Gopal Jayal, Ornit Shani, Uditi Sen, Kalyani Ranamath, and of course our own Rohit Day. Um, so a few questions around uh, the contribution of your work to studies of citizenship and belonging in post-colonial India. How might one think of minor processes of urban planning and development undertaken by non-state actors? And how does that revise our understanding of planning in post-independence India? What does the study of French decolonization in India illuminate about state and citizenship particularly um, since it's you know, a site that's not usually regarded as exceptional in the vein of um, spaces of emergency such as Kashmir or Assam. And lastly, I would suggest that your scholarship has also resulted in a critical re-evaluation about the dominant nation state imaginary that informs many of the studies of this period. Um, in fact, many, um, many competing political formations and imaginaries have been sort of subsumed under this sort of master category of the nation state. Um, and nowhere is this more apparent in the equation of decolonization with the creation of the nation state or in the subsuming of all nationalisms and critiques of colonialism within the single form of anti-colonial nationalism. So one set of questions that your work explores is the variegated nature of political imaginaries of empire and nation and of citizenship and subject that animated politics in the 20th century. And here, I think that the dimension of your work that really stood out to me was to really um, analyze the flourishing of competing political moods with distinct conjunctures and distinct con concepts of the political um, through the framework of historical temporality. So the temporal apprehensions of specific eventful crises in your work, um, I think uh, is an acknowledgement of the multiplicity and sedimentation of different conceptions, different timelines of the political. Um, and I would also suggest that uh, citizenship in the age of decolonization in Asia has by and large referenced Britain for you know, obvious reasons. Um, or in, in certain cases, it's been compared to the model of citizenship and political thought that thinkers such as Senghor or Césaire imagined during the French decolonization period in Africa and the Caribbean. Your work offers the opportunity to uh, weave these two strands of scholarship together and to follow other itineraries between the accepted territorial boundaries of either empire or nation state, following um, the unexpected itineraries of peoples, ideas, commodities, goods in the age of decolonization at multiple scales and geographies. It emphasizes that studies of decolonization must transcend the territorial boundaries of empire and provides a new critique of the naturalized idea of Indian citizenship in the age of decolonization. Um, the second big field in which I view your work as sort of contributing to is in studies of settler colonialism. Um, and here I would suggest that um, your work uh, allows for a proper appraisal of settler utopianism in its specificity and suggests that colonialism and settler colonialism should be understood um, in their dialectical relation. So neither are entirely separate nor part of the same conceptual field. Um, I'm just going to present a sort of uh, broad sort of overview of the historiograph uh, the sort of historiographical concerns around settler colonial studies writ large. Um, um, I would suggest that here the framework of settler colonialism emerged most powerfully with the publication of uh, Patrick Wolfe's Settler Colonialism and the Transformation of Anthropology in 1999, where he argues that um, the colonizers come to state. Invasion is a structure, not an event. It's also important to point out that the categories of settler and indigenous should not be understood as pre-existing or immutable, as Mahmoud Mamdani has pointed out, that the native is the creation of the colonial state. Um, colonized the native is pinned down, localized, thrown out of civilization. Um, indigenous scholar Glenn Coulthard um, has also pointed out the perpetual need for settler societies to define themselves in opposition to indigenous populations, despite attempts to eliminate the collective claim over land. Um, a comparative and connected perspective on settled colonialism that your, your work offers um, stresses the need for these conceptual threats to be interwoven um, together. So your work in your chapter on Auroville specifically as a, as a form of settler utopianism and a specific articulation of land, labor and capital really stood out to me um, because I think that here it's an attempt at avoiding um, the collapsing of colonial relation into capital relation with uh, which many scholars in settler uh, colonial studies have warned us against, um, but at the same time to also reckon with um, questions of political economy, subtending processes of settler colonialism in South India. 
Um, so here, my question then is, how might we think about the shifting modes of political economy um, undergirding the, uh, this sort of like Auroville project? Um, this process that's fundamental to the settled colonial enterprise is, you know, the creation of a capitalist labor order and the alienation of workers from their means of production. Um, what you offer is a historical analysis of both capitalist transformation and settled colonialism that provides a fuller picture of the process of displacement than a totalizing approach of either framework would allow. Capitalism and settled colonialism should not be conflated as a trans-historical abstraction, but rather assume different forms under changing social, economic, and political conditions. The third broad cluster um, in which I see your work as contributing to is in intellectual histories of liberalism and colonialism. Um, intellectual histories of liberalism in South Asia has overwhelmingly focused on the trajectories of specifically Anglo-liberalism in modern South Asian political thought. So this um, sort of historiography has been routed through Eric Stokes' early work um, on the English utilitarians in India, Ode Mehta's Liberalism and Empire, Karuna Mantena's A Study of Henry Maine in Alibis of Empire, as well as more recently, Chris Bailey's Recovering Liberties, which has sought to recuperate certain um, Indian political thinkers within the liberal tradition as well as Andrew Sartori's Liberalism and Empire, which argues that um, there are certain vernacular claims to land that are broadly aligned with the Lockean construction of property through labor. I suggest that French India, and um, which you have said, offers us a different space to think about the itineraries of liberalism in the context of South Asia. And here I want to point to this sort of distinction that uh, we tend to draw in intellectual history between two liberal traditions. On one hand, Anglo-American liberalism, and on the other hand, French republicanism. And there are certain uh, characteristics to French republicanism that uh, many intellectual historians of France have identified. That firstly, that it's never entirely subsumed to the methodological individualism that um, dominates Anglo-American liberalism. Secondly, French liberal theories have um, uh, this idea that political ideas are intimately related to specific historically circumscribed modes of life. Um, and thirdly, that French uh, republicans um, never defined liberty solely in terms of non-interference or to private happiness, but always included a kind of fulfillment that comes with public action. Um, so here, I want to uh, perhaps ask you a little bit about the itineraries of republicanism or of liberal thought that occurs within the space of French India. And as you said, the Madras presidency between, uh, between 1900 and 1920 was undergoing a very intensive period of anti-colonial activity. Um, a number of revolutionaries were actually based in Pondicherry for the reasons that you've outlined, including Subramania Bharati, who is a Tamil poet and writer, um, and VVS Iyer, who is, who is a Tamil radical who arrived in Pondicherry in 1910. Um, so what is the distinct role of Pondicherry and the other Comtois in this period? Um, in the history of ideas writ large, how do we think about, on one hand, Pondicherry's material role as a transnational space for anti-colonial radicalism, and on the other hand, the influence of French republicanism and um, the forms of legal rights um, it offered um, and the, the intellectual atmosphere it offered for these forms of anti-colonial theorizing? Um, to what extent were these anti-colonial discourses um, not entirely influenced, but perhaps conditioned by or responsive to French republicanism as a political structure? And in what ways did French republicanism um, organize or um, influence the systems of land tenure, um, property, and inheritance that was evident in Pondicherry? Um, lastly, I want to suggest that what's important here and the, the, the sort of overriding contribution of your work is to recognize the diverse and multiple ways in which um, histories of India and Indian political thought was under construction during this period, and that many of them were involved in producing different ideas about what the future of South Asia should look like. Um, in our day and age, I think that that's a very important um, um, time and space to revisit, especially in the face of um, our political present. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ali. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to take, the, to take this opportunity to thank the Modern Europe Colloquium, as well as the South Asian Phase Colloquium for inviting me to this event. I'm truly honored to exchange with the Professor Namakal today. Um, I just want to start by saying that I find this book courageous because it takes on a cherished, immaculate, and untarnished object of history and historiography which is the decolonization. It is pointing us toward a fascinating, but also dreadful idea that modernity is always coterminous with a certain utopian thinking that bears within it. 
the dangerous sea. Professor Namakal raises the uncomfortable idea that futurisms and utopias are colonial in essence. In a way, she's warning us against the danger of the of the colonial thinking that could dwell in any form of utopic word making and fate in the future. Professor Namakal is arguing that Oroville is in many ways a colonial project in the midst of decolonization, but at the same time, it is a, deco a decolonial project since it shares a DNA and practice of word making with the product of decolonization she denounces. That is the, po the post colonial uh, state, nation state. Or to put it in uh, Porto Sharadzi's words, just as we continue to live in the age of nation state, so have we not transcended the age of empire. Far from celebrating the colonization, this book complexifies its history and present and is very careful in tracing its too many pitfalls. It reinstates the false promise of a new land discovered or brought to life by colonial or capitalist dispossession, displacements or forced migrations at the center of the colonial utopias. And here, of course, looms the specter of the partition. Writing against the grain of both academic and popular discourse that treat, that treat the colonization as a complete defense. What the book is arguing is not only that colonization is lingering, that is tough to extort, or that there remains vestiges of, uh, of another historical phase, but that just as decolonization is happening, you have the institution of a brand new colonial project with a renewed faith in the coming of the future of modernity. Thanks to once again European technologies and savoir faire in the case uh, uh, Professor Namakal studies, reformulated acts of colonial settlement. The book is breaking the consensus that exists between both the post metropole and the post colony to recognize decolonization as realized, the oppressors as chased, the oppressed as liberated. Instead, it proposes a definition of decolonization as an always fragile process, a method and a praxis that constantly has to be reassessed, that constantly has to reconsider the margins and the marginalized. It is inevitably, inevit inevitably creating. Here, I would like to ask Professor Namakal what in her view is preventing historiography from seeing the colonization for, for what it was, always incomplete, always problematic, in securing European privileges and even as a failure, to ask, to what do we owe this last historical taboo? In, in the conclusion of her book, Professor Namakal ends with a reflection on conducting the colonial history. She explains that history as a discipline and the historical scholarship methods are products of colonial epistemology. And in order to do decolonial history, one has to deal with the messiness of colonialism and dig deep into this mess. Highlighting that, the, that categories and categorization in Franz Fanon's terms are created and employed by states and institutions to control colonized subjects. Professor Namakal argues that the use of categories is only useful up to a certain point. Uh, quote, once one, once one recognizes that the unruly mess of history is actually bursting the seams of categorical boxes, end quote. Coming from a French and Francophone literature department, I could not help but think when reading this, this call to acknowledge the bursting of the seams of these categorical boxes about the work of Harry Gauthier in Carnet Secret de la Cuchemie or, or Le Tinet. Francophone literature from uh, Pondichéry is a powerful, yet very rare tool to dig deep into the mess, bringing crucial deconstructive literary modalities. Gauthier's novels possess a potential to dismantle the community of power of the French language, thereby enabling it to become an impossible property, as Derrida and Khatebi proposed, a testament that doesn't have, belong to anyone. One of the major methodological and intellectual contributions of the book is the idea of the subversive power of minor, minor histories. Minor histories, Professor Namakal argues, are threatening and displacing the central narrative. They are, as she forcefully phrases, she forcefully phrases it, a destabilizing force that seeks to destroy the center of power from within. Walter Benjamin was also very fond of this form of historiography which he called writing from the scraps of history, or as Professor Namakal calls it, it's mess. One cannot but ask the question of the gatekeepers in history. If something is indeed irrelevant, so minor, so harmless, 
white and dominant narrative of history, of empires, and of nation state, just let it be. Why does it have to be subordinated, translated, and thus tamed? The other major argument in the decolonial approach she proposes is that any true decolonial project, far from searching for, an explored, uh, for unexplored domains or territories, has to dwell in the margins, in the liminal space, in the borders, because the border, as the book argues, is much richer in its complexity. It is thus fascinating how something that is used to define and separate is itself entangled and undefinable. Uh, thank you, uh, Ali. Uh, I'm just going to hand over the proceedings to Lauren Crawford, uh, who is a graduate student in the Department of History as well. Uh, Lauren. Thank you, Rohit, and thank you, Ali and Kelvin, uh, for your wonderful responses. Um, I think if we want to hand things over to Professor Namakal first uh, to answer those questions, and then for anyone in the audience, if you'd like to message me directly uh, your question or write in the Q&A chat or in the chat function, I can read them out aloud as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. These are um, incredibly rich um, questions, and I'm sure I won't be able to get to all of them. Um, just amazing feedback, though. Thank you for your close readings and for helping me um, sort of understand how some of these, what I call minor histories, fit into larger um, fields and questions that other people are thinking about. I think that's really um, what I wanted to do with this. So I just got worried I was muted, but I was not. Okay, um, so you know I'll start uh, maybe with Ali um, and Ari uh, Gautier. I highly recommend everyone um, read his books if you do not read French. Um, one of them has just been translated into English, the Tanai, um, T-H-I-N-N-I-A. So um, please do check check out his work. Um, it's a Pondicherian novelist, um, and and I think doing the work exactly. Uh, that you that you suggest, Ali, that like really giving a sense, you know, I, I, I you know, my, my concern in a lot of ways in the book was the lives of French Indians, but there's only so much our archives um, give us on that without, um, without being able to do in depth interviews. Um, so uh, his, his work as a novelist and, but um, as someone who has or roots in Pondicherry is incredibly important um, and does a lot of the questioning of space and time that, that I'm trying to get at, but I think he is able to do on a sort of much more grassroots level than I am. So I think literature certainly um, serves that purpose. Um, I, you know, I think this, this other question you ask about what is preventing sort of historiography and history from seeing decolonization for something wider than it is. And I mean, I, I think that's changing, I hope. Um, I mean, my, I think it may be a sort of a simple answer to me in some way, which is that even though, you know, as a discipline, we've, re we've rejected the nation state for a long time, it hasn't gone away. Right, and part of this is, you know, contemporary life, you know, the nation becomes the nation state seems to be more powerful than ever. Um, you know, borders um, and citizenship, as we have seen in India in the past few years, have become even more um, securitized, um, even more attempts at excluding uh, people that, that the state doesn't want to see as legitimate citizens. Um, you know, and I think, you know, we can see some roots of that in the way that post-colonial history is written, is taught. Um, you know, it has been used by people. So, you, you know, we, I, if people know, I mean, there's a recent controversy over decolonial scholar, Walter Mignolo, uh, blurbing a book written by a Hindu, right, judge, right? I won't give any names for anything and he retracted it, but right, this, the, um, the easy ability to use the language of decoloniality and decolonization to talk about sort of any anti-European, but anti sort of modern, um, the rights of the nation, right? Um, it's really easy to do. And it's also not that uncommon. I mean, I, th I think for those of us, you know, with the politics um, of liberation with an anti-colonial politics, we love anti-colonialism, right? We wanna see more of it. But not all anti-colonialism is the anti-colonialism I love, right? Like I love a queer, feminist, anti-racist, anti-colonialism, right? Anti-border, um, kind of uh, anti-capitalist, anti-colonialism. But that certainly is not what everybody fighting for sovereignty 
was doing, right? And we see that in Adam Getachew's work. We see that um, in lots of work that's coming out now. So I think the more we try to sort of uh, push beyond um, sort of those ideas of what we want from people sometimes um, and how complicated, you know, a desire for sovereignty is, right? I mean, one of the things I'm trying to do in the book or hopefully I did in the book is say people had different ideas of what that would look like, right? Um, and Ali, I think you got it right that for, you know, in Oroville to a lot of people, that's a decolonial project. Right. Um, and, you know, if you look at it through the lens that I give, it certainly isn't. But, you know, it can it can be read that way, too. And it's like patern it's paternalist. <laughs> right. It's the uh, I know what this looks like and, and you don't. Um, it's, you know, it's part of the sort of cult of international development in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, but I, I think the the flexibility in the language, the lack of attention to the complexities of histories of decolonization. Um, I mean, I, I think that's changing, but I, but I do think political movements right now for decolonization from land-based indigenous movements um, to you know, decolonize the academy, decolonize curriculum, decolonize your library, whatever it is, you know, all of that having, um, you know, decolonize your beauty line. <laughs> I think I saw, you know, so it's, there's, again, you can use that word and they mean something, but what does it mean, right? I, I think there hasn't been a lot of attention paid to the language people are using in these movements at the time. So I, I hope that, um, that people start to do more of that work. And I think they are. Um, okay, so I will move to um, sort of Kelvin's questions. And again, I cannot cover all of this. Thank you so much. I can't wait to read your work. Um, from both of you as, as it comes out, of course. Um, yeah, Glenn Coltard is a, uh, is a big influence on here, uh, on this work. Also, um, Kevin Brunel, whose new book, Settler Memory, just came out after this book came out, um, but is also, I think, really important to my thinking about uh, Oroville um, is really important. And it is, you know, I, I think, um, I think I really loved how you articulated that, Kelvin. Thank you so much about um, sort of trying to negotiate how to um, have colonialism and settler colonialism be dialectical, to not collapse each other, right? To be understood as as, as different processes. Um, and I think it's, you know, um, this this is. I did, I started it in here. I'm, I'm hoping to expand this and what I move to next, but I think the spirituality is actually really important to it. And I think in the way, you know, you asked about political economy. I mean, I think spirituality is part of the political economy here. And it's often seen as apart from it. People with spiritual intentions are often forgiven for a lot of things, right? Um, because they're doing it for whatever, you know? And I mean, I think some of this has to do with secular post-colonial India, right? Like we accept people of all religions and, you know, um, I just saw somebody's tweet uh, today uh, with the picture of Nehru and the mother um, in the ashram that's like, Nehru loved everyone of all religions. This is why he was such a great man, which sure, you know, maybe. But you, you, because people have a religious belief and maybe it's um, dedicated to these people, like doesn't excuse from excuse them in my book <laughs> from their actions at the actions that they take. And of course, we can read lots of different um religious, but when it's religious movements like this, you know, when it's Hinduism, when it's Hindutva, like we see that on a mass scale, but when we have these tiny little pockets, like what is that, right? But they actually have this global circulation. Um, there's a lot of money that goes through that. So I, I think um, following the money there is really important. Also, I'll take up your question about liberalism um, and republicanism. Um, and, and I'll say that, you know, I think that uh, French republicanism I mean, there's a new book that just came out about this by Anne Raffin. Um, I think it like just came out on this very question about Pondicherry and French Republicanism. So um, I'm sure her work will tell us a lot about this. Um, but you know, from, from my read in this time period, uh, Republicanism is utopianism to the people in French India, right? Um, in a way that the French wanted it to be. And you know, this is why I mentioned Haiti. It's like people in Haiti knew this wasn't the case, right? Because they were enslaved or Um you know, so it was like incredibly clear, um, but, uh, but for the people in um, Pondicherry, they had never, most of them had been to France. They weren't gonna go to France. People who, you know, the most, most of the people that did go were mixed, um, had mixed racial backgrounds, um, not, not 
completely, um, but but a lot of them, or they had some sort of ties to France, but the vast majority of people, you know, I, I talk about a man in the book named Adala, um, who is a Dalit man who um, grew up in Yanam, was part of the French police force. Uh, he really dreamed of France as a utopia. He, he, you know, he, he claims eventually that he switches over and fights for merger into India because he had been taught through his French education that like a utopia, like French republicanism as a utopian idea was to fight for your motherland. And so for him, he's like, okay, well, I guess my motherland is India. And then in his memoir, which he writes in the 1970s, he say, actually like this place is a hell that treats Dalits like garbage. And like, I should have stayed French, right? Um, so it's really, this geog geography is really important, right? People that do go to France are like, oh, there's racism here, right? Although we're very proud to be French Indian, but nobody wants to hear that. So then you, you know, have sort of the recreation of a little French India in the 10th or in Bismont in Paris um, and now out in the suburbs, but um, they like, it, it's not the integration that they were sold, right? I mean, that's one, part of republicanism. It's not all of it. Of course, there's much more to be said about it. Um, but also for, again, for uh, leaders in, in, in India, for Congress leaders, uh, French Republican was also an ideal, right? Um, so you could critique British liberalism for all of the wrongs, but, um, you know, they, there was a really fine line that was being walked about uh, critiquing French republicanism. So, um, I mean, I guess we could ask um, Professor Day uh, if this influenced the Indian constitution. I, I don't know or not. Um, but but I, I certainly think people were reading um, French republicans and were very invested in that history anyway. Um, and I know you had a lot of other questions, Kelvin, but maybe we'll move on from there. Thank you so much. I, I will rewatch uh, uh, your commentary so I can I can get a better sense of all of it. Thank you so much. Um, I think what I'll just do now is to read some of the cues that have come in through the Q&A function. So uh, Nisha, and excuse me if I'm pronouncing the name wrong, PR asks um, or says, thank you for your fascinating talk. Apologies, I haven't read your book and I hope to read it soon. Uh, I'd like to know how the literary work set in these regions portray these independent struggles or cherish French cultural presence and the difference and difference with the rest of India, a novel like M. Mukadin's Set in Mahe, again, apologies if I've mispronounced that, um, is considered one of the most significant works in Malayalam language itself. Are there any written in French, English, French or English with these regions as their setting? How are they represented? So I, um, as Ali mentioned, um, Ari Gautier's work, I think is the, mm -hmm. is the is friend, he writes in French, but um, there's translation now of one of his novels. Um, there are a few novelists, um, novelists working. There wasn't really, um, there wasn't re a lot of French cultural production during, from people here during the period of formal colonization. Um, and that's one thing Ari's work is trying to sort of address um, is that a, a lot of that doesn't exist. People um, would write in English um, sometimes, but there isn't much writing about, um, about independence itself um, outside of what Ari is doing now. Um, yeah, as a non-literature person, I think that's where I'm gonna leave it. <laughs> yeah, fair enough, I understand that. Um... I guess I'll put these next two questions together. Um, so Sophia Dilianobus asks, uh, just could you speak more about history from the margins and how that informs your archival practices and thinking more generally? Um, I'd second that question. I also wanna know um, if I may. And then NJ says, the concept of settler utopianism that you unpack here with the case of Pondicherry as a former French colony and a continued colonial project through the manifests of sites like Oroville is something very fresh for me in comparison to experiencing the settler colonies of US and Canada. And I was wondering if you could share even if just naming a few right now, other sites or regions where such colonial projects continue to be manifested. Yeah, um, so let me start with that one and go back to the archive question a little bit uh, more broadly. So thank you, NJ. Um, so the settler utopianism is an, I, I put that phrase together um, in order to separate it from settler colonialism, but I think as Kelvin pointed out, to draw on the work, um, and you know, not just the work of scholars, but the work of indigenous led movements. And that's what, you know, what I'm really doing is sort of um, doing what Eve Tuck and Kei Wayne Ying asked us to do in Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, which is like, look at the land, 
right? Um, look at the land tenure, look at the look at the property, um, try to understand how all of that is happening. Um, so that's sort of where my idea of settler utopianism comes from. Um, again, it's not. I do, I do, you know, I think that when you look at uh, the, the economy and um, the labor relations in Oroville, um, you see a very close, like very clearly an extractive economy. But there's also um, other sort of elements of settler colonialism, such as trying to erase the local past, um, trying to um, sort of not erase, erase, but you know, erase that past and that history from the land that Oroville is on, right? There's an acknowledgement of Tamil culture, and um, although it's often sort of derided in a lot of ways, at least early on, um, or looked down upon as you know, um, sort of primitive, uh, the, them with their gods kind of language about it, like they don't have this higher understanding of, of what the divine is, and if they did, they could join Oroville. Um, so, uh, but when you when you look at that, you see very clearly it's an extractive economy, and that people um, that people that are there. Um, sorry, I'm looking at the questions, which is distracting. I shouldn't do that. Um, people that people that are there really think the land is theirs now. So there was a, a memoir that just came out by a man named Akash Kapoor um, called "Better to Have Gone," and he is an Orvillian. Um, he's a writer for the New York Times, The New Yorker, so fairly well known. This is very. It came out just after my book, which is pure coincidence. Um, but he's an Orvillian. He grew up there, uh, went to Harvard, went moved back to Oroville eventually. Um, and reading his biography, and I had or his memoir, and, and I had read other work by him, but um, reading it, I, I really noticed how um, you know. The P he and the people, and he was one of the, he was born there. He was a child that was born there. Um, and so was his wife. Um, and they really see this as their land, right? In an incredibly possessive way. Um, and in a way that, you know, he writes about sort of the problem of feeling like living in a fishbowl and getting irritated by the tourists. But the tourists he's describing are people that live in Pondicherry, right? They're Pondicherians. <laughs> So like, you know, it's only been 50 years, 1968, it was founded, um, just over 50 years. And, you know, the people have completely adopted that. I mean, they have erased the fact that this land, you know, just belong, you know, didn't belong to them very recently. And very little acknowledgement about the colonial past, no acknowledgement of sort of the French history of it, really, except for you know, there's a real French tourist economy there. Anyway, I have gone on a length about that. Um, but but um, in, in terms of other projects, I mean, I, I also think these projects are two things. They, they're, they happen within settler colonies. They are present in Canada and the United States and Australia. I mean, I'd say the big ones and New Zealand. Um, there's a lot of them. This is actually what I'm looking at for my next project. So I have a lot of them. Um, you, you could look at Rajneesh Puram um, in Oregon in the 1980s as an interesting example um, of this. But even earlier um, movements in the United States and a, a big one is the Mormons um, and it, like kind of an obvious one. And this is the language that the Mormons use too. Um, so there's actually a lot of, uh, I think, connections to make there. Um, I mean, I think the reason my argument on Oroville is like the reason it's been so su successful as a movement like that is because it's in India. Like most of the communes like that in the United States fell apart in the 1980s. Um, and, and, you know, the fact that they have Europeans and wealthy Indians who are mostly from Bombay and Delhi and other places um, who are sort of leaving and making money and bringing it back in um, and have set up these really strong businesses has, has made it work um, in a lot of ways. So, um, and then the question about the archives. Um, so when I uh, started, you know, I, I mentioned that I, in reading decolonial work, sort of engaging in both the scholarship on, on theories in post-colonialism, subaltern studies, um, decolonial studies, all of which inform my work in a lot of ways. I also just felt um, in a lot of um, a lot of the time sort of a and sort of an emptiness of, of material reality <laughs> and of political struggle. Um, so that is that is how I see history from below. You know, this is seen in a lot of ways. So I call it from the margins. Um, and I also think, you know, I say this and thank you, Ali, for bringing up this um, 
sentence I wrote about the borders, right? I mean, I think borders are the places we need to look where things are happening. And what I hoped I showed by showing you those borders of what French India looked like is that the, those borders aren't visible to most people, but they are, they are, they're borders. And you know, what happens on borders often is, you know, you get a litany of things that happen on borders. There's a lot of criminal activity there, right? Uh, people are always doing illicit things. Um, so the interesting question to me is like, why are people saying that? And I didn't talk about this, but a big part of the book is this Gunda discourse around the borders, um, which is a way of sort of criminalizing a certain type of person who didn't really belong anywhere, right? And that's actually what the Gunda statutes from the 1920s, 1910s, I can't remember when it went on the books, um, where, they, where they come from, is this idea, it's like, if you were found to be a Gunda, you were expelled from the city right? You had to go somewhere else. One of the things was you didn't have a permanent residence, right? You didn't have an address. Um, so that made you, but you know, th this is the era, this is the 19, early 1950s. This is the era of like everyone in India is like kind of a refuge or a refugee, right? Not everyone, but a lot of people, right? There's been so much movement because of partition. There's so much movement because of the end of formal empire. You know, I'm just talking about Pondicherry, but there's Portuguese India also, there's the princely states, there's Kashmir, right? There's all of these places that are having monumental change and people are sort of refugees everywhere. Um, so I wanted to be able to sort of think different categories for people living on the ground um, in these border zones. And to me, that's what the margins are. Um, and in terms of archival work, I mean, it, this meant going to a lot of different archives, <laughs> different parts of the world, right? Uh, England, India, all parts of India, France, just everywhere. Um, and it also meant using the city as an archive in a lot of way. This is my like amateur geographer um, stuff, right? <laughs> Where it's, um, you know, I think about sort of the placement of the names of streets and the placement of statues. Um, and, you know, I don't go into it too much, but that really told me a lot about colonial memory, the memory of the French. Um, and also, I mean, the other marker there for me in like an, an archive in some ways is the tourist industry um, and like sort of the contemporary tourist industry in, in Pondicherry, which sets a lot of the history for a lot of reasons. But all right, I'll stop there. <laughs> so we have two final questions that hopefully I can um, ask you both um, or sneak in. Um, so the first is from Kostas. Uh, he says, thank you so much, Professor Namakal, for this wonderful talk. I have a question about the relationship between decolonization and the regions you are examining on, on the one hand and natural, scientific, and medical knowledge on the other. My question comes from having engaged with Pro, and I'm, I'm excuse me if I mispronounced this, Proji Mukherjee's work on local non-European science in India, he talks about the early 20th century episteme of Rasayana in India and his focus is Delhi. But I was wondering uh, if what is happening in the space and time you are studying, um, how do local forms of scientific knowledge and French knowledge is, exist side by side in your area of study? And I think I'll just tack on uh, yeah. the question from John Webley. Um, Thank you for this wonderful talk. I look forward to diving into your book now. I'm curious to know if you studied the Mothers International Schools in Delhi and Pondicherry, as far as I know, and their curriculum. If possible, could you comment on how these schools fit into the Utopian Project and the relationship of this education to colonization and decolonization? Great questions, thank you. So I'll start with the science one. Um, you know, I can talk a little bit. I don't have uh, specifics for you, but I can talk um, a little bit about how important um, this area um, of knowledge was for France, right? So um, there are a lot of people, well, two things. There are a lot of people coming um, from France and uh, Air France is the only airline that has a direct flight to Chennai from Europe, <laughs> right? So the, this relationship between France and India, you know, if you are French, tourists going to India, you're going to go to Pondicherry, right? Like you have to. Um, and, you know, that's today, but this is so the study of all kinds of things um, and I, in the French Academy at the Sorbonne is, is a, a, there's a lot of people studying India, right? And they're using these connections to do so. I mean, I can say, you know, Louis Dumont, who's a sociologist, um, wrote this book on caste that has been used for um, many, many years. Um, 
that was meant to that was uh, it, monumental work on on cast, you know, and he was French. And again, he's utilizing sort of these knowledge networks. Um, so it's not that he's based specifically in Pondicherry, but he is able to sort of access this because of um, the French presence in India. And and they're in it's not just a presence; it's um, it's a it's an invest it's an investment, right? Um, creating knowledge about this place was very important. Um, I'm sure there's a lot to say about doctors. You know, it, it, Amitav Ghosh's um, the uh, Sea of Poppies actually has some references to. Um, to French uh, botanists working um, in, in the area, things offhanded. Um, the other thing I'll say is that at the moment of, uh, that France agrees to leave, um, as they're negotiating, what they do is they set up several institution, academic institutions in Pondicherry. Um, so the, um, there's a lycée, to, you know, so kids can learn French and um, actually take the baccalaureate and, and go to college in France. And all of this, but there's also um, there's two others. They, there's the uh, institute, the French Institute of Pondicherry, and they do all kinds of um, scientific research from um, from archaeology to botany to you know social sciences. They're doing all kinds of work, philology at the French Institute, and the French government pays for that to this day. Um, so that's funded by the French government. And there's another, now I can't remember which one it is, but there's another school that the French government finances. Um, so that is something they wanted to retain. Right, was that um, that ability to have uh, sort of an inroad to studying India, um, and and they do a lot of work on South India, which again is a shift from sort of the traditional um, British approach. Um, okay, and then uh, what was the last question? Oh, the mother about the mother schools. Um, okay, so uh, funny, I I haven't been well. The the school in Pondicherry is the ashram school. Um, and I have read quite a bit about the ashram school. You know, my work really stops when she dies. I mean, I haven't written about post 1973, but there's a lot to say about the ashram school before then. There's a real focus on physical education um, in there. Um, they play a lot of tennis, um, but but there's also, you know, um, they, they learn French. Um, and it's interesting, I, one, I, I had a student who for, at Duke who uh, went to the mother's school in Delhi. <laughs> And so that was fun. He like came and told me about it. Um, and, and I was also talking to um, someone recently who sort of mentioned that, um, you know, they're not just in Delhi and in Pondicherry. I think there's one in Bangalore. And they're really sort of elite, they're elite schools, right? I mean, if I'm getting students here at Duke um, from them, obviously they're, they're sending students abroad. And I've heard from some students at these schools um, who have just written to me and sort of noted um, the insularity of them, the divisions between, especially in Pondicherry, the divisions um, between um, the what goes on in the ashram school versus what goes on sort of in the rest of Pondicherry. Um, so I'm sure there are some interesting things to, to talk about there, but I haven't, um, I haven't done that research. It's all anecdotal, but people keep bringing it up to me. So there must be something going on there. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much you. for yeah. all these questions. I'll turn it over to Rohit. Um, I, sorry, is it, was, did the question just come in, uh, Laura? Oh, no, I think just someone, um, NJ, uh, elaborating on an earlier question oh, yeah. I had asked. Uh, so uh, there are no final questions. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jessica, uh, Ali, and Kelvin for, for joining us and everyone else who joined us today. Uh, we'll be back next week at the same time. Uh, 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 and we'll, we'll find a list of our future events. Uh, Lauren, if you could share the European Studies events link as well um, uh, over, the, over the next month. So thank you again. And uh, it was very good having one of you. Thank, thank you. Me. Thanks for having me, everyone. Thank you.